Welcome back to the Healthy Dose Podcast. I'm Dr. Joe Gambardella with Dr. Buzz Korth, Advanced Physical Medicine and Rehab down in South Florida, and Buckeye Physical Medicine and Rehab up in Columbus, Ohio. How you doing, Buzz? Hey, what's going on, Joe? Hey, everything is great. We got the Super Bowl coming down here to Miami. Lots of busy uh, people running around South Beach, having a good time. We're expecting uh, snow this weekend. Oh my gosh. Well, let's let's warm people up with uh, some some hot topics. We're coming yes. to the end of uh, the end of the month. You know, people are, are you know getting set with their workout plans. Uh, we had a bunch of people sign up on weight loss programs this week, already starting to lose weight. So, kind of the next topic, really, that makes the most sense to talk about is injuries and injury prevention. Some of the most common things that we'll see in a physical medicine practice. Um, I know up by you, you work a bunch with uh, athletes. You worked uh, in conjunction with uh, a lot of the pro teams, pro teams up there, um, you know, on and off with Ohio State. Uh, down here, we've been on and off with um, uh, Flor- uh, FIU and did, did quite a bit of work with the uh, University of Miami some years back. So, you know, the injuries that we see are, are common to the high school, college, as well as the professional. I think one of the good places we can start off is work our way out. So we'll start with the spine. You know, some of the common neck injuries or lower back injuries that we see. Um, Sometimes people wake up with them. Sometimes they get it after working out. Sometimes it happens while they work out. What happens, uh, Buzz, let's say a patient works in. I think people really want to hear about the screening process that we have at our physical medicine centers, how meticulous it is, how diagnostic it is. Uh, you, You mentioned, I guess, take a step back. You mentioned a great story before we got on about a patient that you were working with who was diagnosed with hip pain. I think everybody needs to hear about this. Yeah, so, and this this happens all the time. We had a patient that had a prior hip surgery and started developing pain in uh, like his butt region, you know, on the same side as where he had the hip surgery. Uh, had been treating at different medical doctor's office and, and even orthopods for the past year. And they really focused treatment on the hip area and uh, the pain was progressively getting worse. So then they actually started doing, they actually did a cortisone injection on his knee. And then someone had said that the pain, they thought it was referring up from his knee, which is not possible. But, um, and out of desperation, you know, we, a lot of times we get the people when nothing else has worked out, right? Right. Uh, this guy shows up to our office and within two minutes, I was like, has anyone looked at your back? Because we know, you know, back pain often, well, you, you can have a back injury and have no back pain. You would have pain in your butt, pain in your groin, pain behind your knee, pain in your foot. So just because your back doesn't hurt doesn't mean you don't have a back injury. The same thing with neck. We see it all the time, Joe. People will come in with a neck injury, but it'll hurt their shoulder. So they'll be going to the doctor and, you know, the doctor's treating their shoulder with PT, cortisone, all this stuff that doesn't work and the shoulder doesn't get better. Well, it's not a shoulder injury. It's a, it's a, it's a disc injury in the neck that's been misdiagnosed and, You know, part of the fault of that is that the medical system we have today, uh, you know, a lot of doctors are incentivized to try to keep expenses down in in an MRI can be an expensive test. Uh, Although we have cash, you know, it's it's really inexpensive if you pay cash, right? Mm -hmm. But but there's this aversion to ordering MRIs because, you know, people might not know this, but if you're a doctor and you order more MRIs than your peers and you're in a network, you can get kicked out of the network. So it's not about what's doing right for the patient. It's about saving money for the insurance company and being in the network, which is really sad. So, you know, yeah, this guy here has been suffering for the past year and his results came back tonight and it's a clear, it's a disc in his low back. So we've wasted a year. The guy's been in pain for a year. He's literally walking with a, with a, with a cane now. And it's something that, you know, we're going to, we'll be able to jump on care tomorrow. We'll do a decompression class four laser. And this guy's going to be better. My predictions within two weeks. Incredible. So it's a, just a typical example of just being misdiagnosed. And, you know, the other thing, Joe, is you got to understand when, when a person goes to their primary care, and this is not slamming primary care, primary care physicians can't be heart experts, pain experts, uh, cold and flu experts, psychologists. They, 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 you can't be good at everything, right? You can't be a jack of all trades. And, and, but the way our system's set up is you, you have, whether you have back pain, the flu, high blood pressure, you go to your primary care doctor and they're expected to diagnose and treat you properly and they just can't do it. That's why, you know, it, if you have some musculoskeletal injury, you know, I always think see a chiropractor or, or someone that specializes it, it, And the reason I like chiropractors, especially an integrated practice like yours or, or mine, Joe, is we have chiropractors, we have physical therapists, and we have medical providers, and that's all we do is treat pain. Yep. And we're all specialists. And, you know, I know at your office and the same thing in my office, when you come to my office, 
you're going to see the Cairo, you're going to see the PT and the medical doctor, and then we're going to have a meeting about you. And we all look at things a little bit differently. So the, the medical providers say, here's what I can do medically. The PTs will say, here's what I can do with the PT. And then I'm going to say, here's what we can do with Cairo. And, and that team approach is a lot better than seeing a primary care who doesn't specialize in it and gives you pain pills and maybe sends you to, uh, to, to some type of rehab facility and you know, treating the wrong reason. Yeah. You know, when, when you have a team of doctors that are ho- highly qualified, nationally certified in spinal decompression, fellowship trained in stem cell therapy, diplomat trained in bioidentical hormones, certificate in peptide therapy. I mean, we really do look at it from a very uh, holistic top to bottom approach, inside out approach. One of the things we learned way back when, when we were studying biomechanics and how the body works is never to isolate a single joint. I, I think it's almost a minority of times that one joint malfunctions at a time. You have to look at what they call a kinetic chain, right? If somebody has knee pain, you got to look at the hip, you got to look at the foot. Um, is the foot pronating? Do they have flat feet? What's the wear of the foot look like? So many things come into this. It's not just, you know, give a drug or a medication and treat the symptom when the underlying cause remains untreated. Uh, an analogy I like to use that we learned almost in the very beginning of what we did was, was the pebble in the shoe. And you could relate this to any symptom that you have. Take, remember, if you have headaches, if you have knee pain, if you have back pain, how do you want to treat that? You know, uh, when you talk about a pebble in a shoe, if you have a pebble in your shoe and it's putting pressure on the bottom of your foot or or a nerve on the bottom of your foot and it's causing pain, well, what do you want to do with it? How do you fix it? Do you, do you yeah, you, I mean, you take a pill for it? Uh, I guess you could take a pill and then eventually what happens when, when the pill wears off? There's press, still pressure on the bottom of your foot, it's still there. So we uncheck that box or cross that off. We can massage it, we can exercise it, we can give it all the nutrition we want, but if there's still pressure on a nerve on the bottom of the foot, you're still gonna have pain. You just kick right. the can down the road. So what makes the most sense is do the simplest things first, analyze the posture, analyze the spine, see if there's biomechanical changes, pressure on nerves. You really simply take the pressure off of the nerve and how do you think the patient feels? Maybe the hard bone off the soft nerve. That's it. You know, and then any other problems that have arisen in the muscle over time because of poor biomechanics, because of improper training, bad form, if there's a muscle injury, if there's a joint injury, then we can isolate and treat those as well. But we've started from the inside out, top down, and that's how we're really able to treat these people as a whole uh, and do it without side effects and do it safely. When someone has, I like to say here, if the joint bends, there's going to be a problem with it over time. So when you're working out, what bends? The neck, the lower back, the shoulders, the elbows, the knees, the feet. That's why people come to see us. When, when people get in trouble working out or, or because of age, rarely do they come in and say, you know, the middle of my leg hurts or the middle of my pec hurts. It's always my elbow hurts, my neck hurts. It's the part of the body that moves the most. We keep it simple because we, we really look at it at a cellular level as well. There's, there's three basic cells that we look at when we're talking about healing, white blood cells, red blood cells, and stem cells. White blood cells have a function really to, to, to measure the function of the immune system at different times. You can tell if the body is battling a bacterial infection, a viral infection, an opportunistic infection, just by looking at those levels, which we, which we can in our office because both of us have full labs here. Then you have the red blood cell, which function is to take oxygen from the lungs to different tissues of the body and bring it back to get reoxygenated. And then the stem cell, and really, they, they, they all work together. So your patient, Buzz, who had that lower back injury that has that herniated disc, let's talk about why that is not going to get better by itself without treatment. We give an analogy. Yeah, of, uh, yeah. Sorry, Buzz, of almost yeah. trying to get toothpaste back into a tube. It's just, it can't happen by itself. Yeah, I mean, a herniated disc or a bulging disc, there's, all, there's a lot of different uh, names for these things. But I've heard herniations, bulge, ruptured they're all the same thing and basically what that you know the, the analogy i like to use is kind of it's like a jelly donut right and the the jelly is starting to leak out of the donut right it's torn through the dough and it's leaking out and as you said the, the jelly is not going to go back in on its own the toothpaste isn't going to go back in the, into the in, into the, the bottle so and these things the other key thing to understand is if you have a disc injury in your spine anywhere it always gets worse it, it progresses you know, and, and when I say it always progresses, it, it, it progresses to the point where you, if you don't do something about it, you're going to need surgery. And a lot of people say, well, I'll never have back surgery. If your back pain is bad enough, you'll have back surgery, right? You know, I mean, so, so, so you can't say you'll never have surgery because the pain's that intense, you, you'll have to have surgery. 
The good news is with the technologies we have, decompression, cold laser, the use of allograph with stem cells, these things, we heal them every single day in our office. Mm-hmm. I mean, these are people that have been told you have to have a back surgery. You know, there's nothing else you can do. We've done everything possible. And that's, that, that's just not the case. The body, if you're alive, you can't heal. You may need some assistance, whether that, that's using an allograph of stem cells, laser shock wave. Uh, you know, we have lots of different tools in our toolbox. But what's unique about our practices is we, we really focus on getting the body to heal itself. Could be using bioidentical hormones, could be using peptides. There's no cookie cutter, right? I mean, every person that comes in it is an individual. But if you're alive, we can help. Now, if you're dead, we can't help you. Right. Yeah, but, but if you're alive, you have the ability to heal. If you doubt that and you listen to this, if you got cut, would your cut heal? If the answer is yes. If I get cut, it heals. Then why doesn't your back heal? Why doesn't your disc heal? Mm-hmm. It just needs help. Yep. Let's, let's go into a little bit more depth about treating these disc injuries. Um, 80% of people over the age of 60 are going to have degeneration. Almost 95%, as a matter of fact, are going to have some sort of degeneration in the disc, meaning they can't absorb stress. So that all of that stress goes to the disc. When all roads lead to the disc, eventually the nerve is going to become inflamed and irritated. So patients, you know, you're sitting out there, you're listening in your car, you're sitting with your family listening to the show. You have leg pain, back pain. It gets worse when you cough or sneeze. If you're taking a medication that's an anti-inflammatory, if you're taking a muscle relaxer or an opioid, with 100% certainty, you're treating the symptom with very poor results, most likely, because the underlying cause is not touched by any of those medications. When, the, when you come into an office like ours and you're cleared, you've gone through your x-rays, you have the MRI, we know exactly how to treat that disc. Uh, you know, a lot of the work that we, we do is based on uh, Dr. Norman Shealy. He's a uh, medical doctor out of um, Harvard University. He's probably the most published doctor on spinal decompression in the world done more studies on that and when we find out if the disc is dried out if it's bulged which is an early early stage herniation if there's a full-blown herniation really you simply get on the table let the table do the work with these protocols and you get better yeah and and you know using the laser the the allograft containing stem cells this is actually turning back the clock of time turning back the aging process to get the outer layer of the disc to heal so you've controlled and contained that disc so that it's actually healed and, 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 you know, you can go on with your daily lives and you're not doing the damage to your kidneys, to your intestines, uh, and to your liver by taking these medications to block the pain. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize too, the first thing this person said when they came in today, is they said that the, uh, the doctor who'd been misdiagnosing him the whole time, uh, he, he took my, the MRI we had and, and called his doctor and the doctor's like, Oh yeah, you have this herniation here. Uh, we can do an epidural and that might help for a little bit. Mm-hmm. So what you what people don't understand is epidurals, cortisone injections, any corticosteroid injection, which is common practice, right? This stuff causes bone and ligament degeneration and damage. So you have this guy here who's in his 70s, already has a herniated disc in his back, and now you're going to put cortisone in there to damage the tissue and disc more. Does that, there's no logic to that whatsoever. And the same thing with pain meds, like you talked about, Joe. The, the analogy you gave was great, the pebble in a shoe. If you have a rock in your shoe, you have a hard rock on a soft nerve, it hurts, right? And you walk around. So taking uh, corticosteroid, uh, opioid, pain medication, whatever you call, would be the equivalent of taking that medication for a rock in your shoe. Would that make any sense? Not at all. Because at the end of the day, you still have a hard rock on a soft nerve. Yep. You know, it, you know so, so obviously that's not gonna fix the problem. And the, and the difference in the way we treat things in, in, in a lot of uh, traditional physicians is, is finding out what is the cause of this and what's actually gonna fix it. I don't care about masking it. What's gonna fix the problem so it doesn't come back. Yep. You know, and, and all of those you know, medications that are used, they, they come with specific instructions. I, I love asking my patients, when's the last time you read the bottle? of aspirin, when's the last time you read the the back of the bottle of ibuprofen? Because there are specific instructions on how to take that, specific instructions on the side effects that they cause, specifically the increased incidence of cardiovascular episodes, including stroke from from taking anti-inflammatories, ibuprofen bought over the counter. No one knows, almost no one knows the length of time that it's safe to take these drugs. The physicians cover themselves by putting a warning label on the back of every single bottle. And it says, do not take longer than 10 days unless prescribed by your physician. And the reason that they say that is because of of the significant damage that it does when taking them, even short term or long term. We mentioned a few episodes back that, you know, in the 
society that we have now where people drink too much, eat too much, take too many drugs, still the number one leading cause of acute liver failure in the United States today, 51% of all liver failure, acute liver failure is caused by acetaminophen. Which is Advil. Tylenol, Tylenol that you buy yeah. over the counter. Absolutely yeah. incredible. It's still, it still floors me, that statistic when I hear- That's in hydrocodone too, I think, right, Joe? With the, with yep. the opioid mix with it, yeah. Yep, yep. So, yeah. you know, there's a purpose for all of these things. Anyone who's ever had surgery, thank God they're there. But for management of chronic conditions or even acute conditions that become chronic that are being treated over the course of weeks and months, these are definitely not the safe or effective option. Well, a lot of people don't realize, too, you know, ibuprofen can be deadly also. Um, you know, we're talking, we're talking about Advil. You know, people assume because you can buy, you can go to, to uh, you know, like a discount store and buy a, a thousand count of an Advil or, or a Tylenol, that these medications must be safe. You know, I can send my 13-year-old son to go buy it, so it must be safe. You don't have to worry about it. But it could be farther from the truth, you know, that, you know, taking Advil long-term, increased cardiovascular risk and gastrointestinal kidney liver problems also. So just because you can buy a thousand at a time and it's over the counter doesn't mean it's safe to knock all the directions. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and at the end of the day, the other thing that, that we even know from doing a lot of the allograft of stem cells, taking Advil and these NSAIDs in particular also inhibits cartilage growth, you know, because, you know, it, it, because of the prostaglandin effect. So, so, if you have an arthritic joint and you're taking Advil on a daily basis, not only you are, are putting yourself at risk for gastrointestinal and other problems, but your body's gonna literally quit growing cartilage. Yeah. So it makes no sense to take for arthritic long-term. These medications, they're not bad medications, they're meant for short-term use. You stub your toe, uh, you have a minor procedure done. I have no problem with someone taking these medications short-term, short, short -term, you know, just like the bottle says. It was when you get, you know, taking them two, three, four weeks at a time, and there's people out there that take them daily. Mm -hmm. So bad for you. When we come back after this buzz, we are, we are going to speak about allograft containing stem cells, how they're used to treat conditions uh, like lower back pain, how we get the body to actually utilize these cells so the body could heal itself, uh, whether it's the lower back, the neck, the knee, or the shoulder. And we're going to do that right after this break. Repair your body, replace your key hormone levels, allow your body to regenerate itself without surgery or meds. When it comes to your health, the best plan is preventative. If you wait for symptoms to show, you could be too late. With over 40 years of combined clinical experience, all under one conveniently located state-of-the-art facility, Dr. Joe is on the leading edge of regenerative and physical medicine. Take control of your health and get a free consultation and evaluation. Visit us at apmrmiami.com or call 305-598-877. 708-8788-305-598-8788-305-598-8788. Now we're back with Dr. Buzz up in Columbus, Ohio. I'm Dr. Joe down in Miami, Florida. We were speaking about non-surgical solutions to lower back pain, how to treat knee pain, shoulder pain. Really the basic premise is we want to do it non-surgically without drugs and we want to get the body to heal itself, just like it has for the majority of our life. Dr. Buzz, allograft containing spe uh, stem cells, that's definitely one of your subspecialties. I know you've dedicated you know, a large portion of your life and practice toward researching these cells, finding out which cells are compliant, uh, how to use them in orthopedics, how are these cells used in our body. I'm, I'm going to just get the conversation started by saying that in orthopedics, there's primarily two types of stem cells that are commonly used. Uh, stem cells that come from bone marrow and stem cells that come from umbilical cord tissue. We call these allograft-containing stem cells. There's a really appropriate use for a bone marrow graft or a bone marrow transplant and there's a very appropriate use for using these allograft containing stem cells. They're not synonymous, they cannot be used interchangeably, um, and the results are really dictated on using the right type of cells for the right type of condition. We'll focus a lot of our conversation on specifically the joint, but maybe you can touch on Dr. Buzz, um, you know, how some of these blood type stem cells are crossing over into treating joints um, and, and the effects that that's having on the uh, overall conversation. Yeah, so, uh... You know, we, we both learned a lot, you, you know, Joe and I have, have been using uh, allografts to contain stem cells, uh, what, for like four or five years now at this point, Joe. Yeah. And, 
we found it worked so well for our practice. Uh, uh, Dr. Gambardell and myself actually got fellowship training in stem cells through George Washington University, uh, just because there was so much misinformation out there, and we wanted to really, uh, you know, do that fellowship program, and, and we learned a tremendous amount. And, and not only that I learn a lot what I really know would help my patients, but I also learned a lot would be that makes no sense, no clinical rationale. And as Joe said, at this point, the only two compliant products would be bone marrow uh, aspiration, and you can harvest stem cells from that, or uh, uh, Ward's jelly, which is the center of the umbilical cord, uh, that Ward jelly tissue uh, from females that have a, a C-section birth and they donate the umbilical cord. Um, there are umbilical cord blood products out there that I don't want people to confuse. Umbilical cord blood has recently been defined as a drug by the FDA, but it's not approved for orthopedic use. So if physicians using uh, umbilical cord blood to treat your knee pain or to do an IV or do anything other than a cancer treatment, uh, he's really doing a non-approved drug and it can be criminal charges. So uh, hopefully your physician is not doing that if you're listening. Um, and then you, you also, uh, body fat, we, we actually both used to do this, Joe. We used to be able to take body fat and spin it down and harvest the stem cells from that, but the FDA has defined that as a drug also. So once again, uh, illegal for use in the United States. Uh, and then the final thing, you, there's been a lot of, of talk about recently is this product called exosomes. Mm -hmm. uh, exosomes are secreted from stem cells uh, but the FDA, once again, has been very clear because of the risk and the unknowns with this, that these are now drugs and they're not approved drugs and they're not approved for anything. So you can't use them off label. So if your physician is using cord blood, exosomes or adipose, they're breaking the law at this point. Now, now as I say that, there's physicians out there all across the country doing it, just, just trying to edu educate the public. So what we're left with is bone marrow and umbilical cord tissue or warts jelly. Now I'll tell you, bone marrow is great if you have some type of blood cancer because not, there's all these different types of stem cells and bone marrow is loaded with what we call a hematopoietic or a blood stem cell. So, you know, if unfortunately you have a blood disease like leukemia, you would want a blood stem cell and bone marrow is very logical. But if you have an orthopedic condition, the type of condition you want for orthopedic injuries is called a mesenchymal stem cell or mesenchymal, depends how you pronounce it. And bone marrow is a terrible source of mesenchymal or mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, I think a four, the average 40 year old male, only one in every 10,000 of the cells, uh, stem cells there are the mesenchymal. And as you get older, that percentage goes down. So as you can see, it makes, there's no clinical rationale. It'd be the same, if you have blood cancer, you wouldn't want umbilical cord tissue, you'd want bone marrow. Well, the same holds true if you have an orthopedic condition, you wouldn't want bone marrow, you would want the umbilical cord tissue. Now, the beauty of the umbilical cord tissue is number one, it's from elective C-section births. And as you know, more and more females are having C-sections in the United States. There is an abundance of this tissue. There is no short supply. Um, the process is very vigorous of how they get this tissue. Basically what happens is it's harvested in a tissue bank, the same way they do blood donations and organ donations. So the, the person's pre-screened, they're blood tested, uh, all of the tissues go through a complete serology test, test for all known bacteria and viruses. And if it passes that whole process, that's what we're using in our practices. And uh, when you add this warden's jelly tissue from umbilical cords, the cushioning and structural support that it provides to your arthritic joints propagates the body to heal itself. And, you know, I think we, between both of us, we've done about 8,000 procedures, Joe. We've done probably more than in the eastern United States. Uh, our success rate is well over 80%. And, and that's crazy because we're dealing with the worst of worst people. Mm -hmm. you, know, you put these tissues in there, we use our other ancillary therapies. We're doing ozone therapy, class four laser, uh, shockwave with this to improve the, the viability of the cells and improve that cushioning and structural support. And, and we're literally taking people scheduled for surgery and returning them back to life without surgery. Yeah, incredible. And that's real that's here today. You know, you mentioned it, Buzz, it's getting the body to heal itself by doing these procedures, specifically the allograft containing stem cells with laser, with shockwave therapy, we're taking a tremendous amount of stress off the body. So really what happens is the stem cells that already are in the body, even though they're older, they start to work better. We're, we're, they're becoming more active. They're starting to release more of these growth factors 
and the body's usually utilizing these growth factors to, to work on the tissue that's been damaged. And what, is the pe what does the patient feel typically when the therapy is becoming successful? They start to move better. They can get in and out of cars easier. They're less stiff when they wake up in the morning. I, you know, I tell patients one of two things is going to happen within the first six to eight weeks of this therapy, and oftentimes sooner, is the intensity of the pain is going to decrease significantly and or the frequency or duration of the episodes is going to decrease. So in other words, pain is going to go down or the number of episodes that you have are going to decrease or the length of time that you have them are going to decrease. And eventually as six, eight, 12 months pass, it's really the opposite of drug therapy where drugs become less effective over time and the pain increases over time. This is typically something that really is a, a, a light at the end of the tunnel or you know a rainbow that you're seeing with a pot of gold at the end at, at the end of the rainbow is people are healing over time it really almost defies medical science but the body is always an amazing organism just like we learned the first day when we went to school yep I always tell people when they get these procedures done you know uh, you know what we expect as far as progression is you know at least 10 percent improvement a month for about for about nine or ten months so we're not going to know the outcome for 10 months right so and that's important to let set people up because we're so used to you know you have pain you take a pill or get a shot and you feel better does nothing to heal it you know we basically you're masking it but the pain always comes back and it comes back with the vengeance because it does nothing to heal and in most situations hinders the healing process when you're using these allografts or you're using, you know, we, we, I know we both use a lot of ozone uh, injections in our, in our practices, you know, the class four laser shockwave, these things we're talking about, these things get your cells to function better and heal better. Even peptides, you know, bioidentical hormones. These are all things that allow your body to heal itself. And as we said about earlier, if you're alive, you can heal. You just have to fit, you know, basically you just need some help and that's what we specialize in. You know, it's funny, Buzz, there's a lot of these clinics that were set up that were doing things that you mentioned that were compliant years ago that are that are not compliant now, uh, that we used to hear bad press about some of the things that we were doing. Almost almost to the exact center, they're starting to utilize some of the protocols. And I don't get offended by that, that more people are doing what we're doing, but I'm very, you know, I'm very proud of what we did. We, we really forged ahead and set... Uh, some standards in the profession that you know people look down on us. What they what they they because of misinformation said that what we were doing wasn't going to work. And sure enough, we're the ones standing at the end. The type of therapies that we utilize, um, I see more and more clinics offering ozone. And the reason they're doing it is is because it works. When right. we, we talk about stem cells, you know another analogy is stem cells like a garden hose. It's got to be turned on. If you don't have any water coming out of the hose nothing's going to grow. And that's what these stem cells are like. You could place a cell, but in order for the body to heal, to, to have any cushioning or structural support, that's, that stem cell has to release something. And, and, and what they release are these things called growth factors. And the growth factors are what your body uses to repair tissue. Uh, the more oxygen that those cells are exposed to, the more growth factors are going to be released. And that really dictates the level of recovery that you're going to have. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of that. I know you are too, Buzz. You go all around the country and take calls from doctors all over the country in, you know, whether it's a uh, pain management physician, an orthopedist, a physiatrist, uh, phys med centers every day. Talk to us, um, you know, about some of the changes that you've seen too. Yeah, so uh, we were doing ozone and these allografts before 90% of people. And, you know, I, I do see more and more centers opening up, offering the same thing. and. You know, I always recommend that, you know, it, make sure if you're wherever you're going, they've had some level of higher training, you know, they didn't just like buy the product and start doing it. You know, the fellowship program we did uh, through George Washington University is, is a great idea. Uh, and some type of formal in, injection training. But uh, the, the cool thing now is you're seeing more, uh, you know, uh, orthopedists getting into this field and medical doctors. You know, I don't know that they'll ever fully adopt it because at the end of the day, surgeons want to do surgery. And, and, and there, there's always going to be a need for surgery because not every person is going to qualify for these procedures, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think for a lot of people, it's going to give you an opportunity to avoid surgery. And at the end of the day, you know, I, I, we, uh, uh, a gentleman that works for me, his father uh, just had uh, hip replacement surgery. He wasn't a candidate for allografts. Uh, it, it was, his hip was too bad. And he got infected. And Joe, I know you can speak of that too. And this, we're talking about this guy is a healthy guy, you know, worked out every day, I want to say late 50s, and he literally almost died from the infection from the surgery. 
Uh, and Joe, I know you can speak of that too. You tore your pec. You were trying to lift that weight. I told you I, I did that day and you got messed up. <laughs> but uh, you tore your pec and, and if a complete rupture of the muscle, you're not a candidate for allograft. So you wouldn't have had surgery. And I mean, talk about your story. You almost died. And you're a healthy guy. You know, you got yeah, Buzz. I, I really, I, I almost blocked this story out because it's uh, it's difficult to to you know bring myself back to that place. It was a dark time uh, mentally, how I felt. But you know, I was working out one night, uh, just like I had so many others, and you know, doing a bench press, and I knew it happened. I you know had to drop the weight. I saw when, as soon as I sat up one side of my chest was on one side of the body and my arm was hanging off the other. So it was, it was definitely a rupture. Two MRIs confirmed that, um, went to a pretty amazing doctor that takes care of a lot of the uh, local sports teams down here. Um, and he did a good job putting me back together, but you know, the, the unforeseen thing that happened was I developed a severe case of cellulitis. And for anyone who doesn't know about that, cellulitis is a severe bacterial infection, um, that can, if it, leaks into the blood could, call, could cause sepsis, septicemia. I think 270,000 people died of it last year, all induced in hospital settings. It could leak into the bone and cause something called osteomyelitis, in which case they would have to amputate you know, or, or remove a portion of the bone. And it, and it happened. It happened to me. Um, so six days after the initial surgery, I was back in uh, for more surgery. They opened me up again, uh, cleaned out as much as they could scheduled to go home in a couple of days. And as soon as the doctor came in and took the bandages off, I knew as soon as I saw his face that I wasn't going home. So he, uh, he opened me up again, took out all of the uh, stitch, you know, the, uh, the sutures and the uh, implants and basically said, we're gonna leave you here until we can get a handle on this. And I was hospitalized for over a week, round the clock, spectrum antibiotics, IV antibiotics, and anyone who says antibiotics don't have side effects, you know, have them come speak to me because, you know, they made my mind race. I couldn't sleep, insomnia. You know, I was thinking about would I ever be able to go back to practice, let alone do the things I like to do, like lift weights or anything else. And, you know, like you said, from a from a 47 year old healthy person that worked out his whole life, that talks about nutrition, uh, keeping people people healthy, keeping people uh, out of hospitals, I found myself right there and uh, it was a very helpless feeling and you know luckily because of you know sound practice um, all of the therapies that we have available to us um, peptide therapy ozone finally this infection got out of my body and I was able to get back you know somewhat to uh, doing the things I like to do it took over a year to be become a hundred percent but I thank God every day for bringing me here and being able to speak to people with a lot of passion knowing what it's like on the other side, that it doesn't always work out. The, the options that we present to patients, there, there really are no side effects. You're, you're, you're losing maybe time, but surgery can always be there. The point that we re really wanna make with a podcast like this is, this is a first choice, not a last choice. Um, when, when you do these therapies, prevention is the best medicine. If you're having shoulder pain and back pain and neck pain, Diagnostics are really going to dictate how well that procedure goes, and the sooner you treat it, that you treat it, the better results that you're going to have. The sooner you use allograft-containing stem cells, the better results you're going to have. The sooner you use ozone, the sooner you use, uh, you know, lasers, low-level laser therapy, class four medical lasers, the better results you're going to have. This is opposite of traditional medicine. We're not waiting long enough for the condition to get bad enough for insurance to cover it. No, we're treating it and letting the body treat the injury and heal so that you can get on with life instead of getting onto a wheelchair or a cane. Right, and I, I think uh, uh, two things that I wanna stress right here too, is number one, surgery is needed sometimes. So we're not here bashing surgery. There are situations where you need surgery, but just as important, just because one person or surgeons told you need surgeon doesn't necessarily mean you need it. So I always recommend, you know, if you, you can get to, to either Joe's office, my office, or someone else that has an alternative care, you know, allograft stem cells, I think, have, get a second opinion. It's worth your time. Get get the second opinion, and you don't have to decide right away. But then then take both options and, and, and make a choice. You know, and, the, and lots of people come to my office. I'll say you need surgery, but if you if you can do something we offer and avoid surgery, that's always going to be a better choice. Always getting the body to heal itself is always better than a surgery because I don't care how good the surgeon is, the way God set you up from the beginning is always better. There's no artificial joint out there that's better than what God gave you. Yep. And, and the majority of people out there that are listening right now, the majority of people that have back pain that's debilitating never have surgery. The, the, the people listening out there that have 
excruciating knee pain, limiting them from going up and down stairs, sitting uh, comfortably for more than 20 minutes at a time, never have surgery. The people that can't lift or do the things that they like to do because they have bad shoulders never have surgery. And so, you, you know, your options are really clear. Either live with that, give up the things that you like to do, or do something that's safe, that's clean, that's effective, and get back to life, get back to doing the things that you like to do. So I'm excited to talk to you, Buzz, all the time. I'm always more motivated. I always learn from you. Um, up there in um, you know, the, the, the Midwest, the, uh, the Northeast, uh, in the Ohio area, tell people how they can find you and your practice. Yeah, you can go right to our website, which is BuckeyePMR.com. Uh, check us out, or you can always email me too. My, my email is pretty easy. It's Dr. Buzz, so D-R-B-U-Z-Z-K at Gmail. Either way, I, I respond to all my emails or you can check out the website, which is BuckeyePMR.com. And I'm Dr. Joe Gambardella down here in Miami, Florida. You can always find out more about us and our practice at APMRMiami.com. Our office number is 305-598-8788. If you're down here for the Super Bowl, rooting for the 49ers or the Chiefs, and you want to feel great for the game, make sure you look us up, APMRMiami.com. We're going to be back next time with Dr. Buzz. Uh, email us at apmrmiami.com or you can email me personally at Dr. J P Gam J G A M B at gmail.com. Let us know what you want to hear about on future episodes, and we'll be back next time.